right, well, welcome everybody for the um, Amatic Problem Solving Session. Amatic is the American Mathematical Association of Two-Year Colleges. So it's the um, math association for two-year co um, college teachers. And so we're all really involved in that. And I don't know if, if any of you have taken the test before, but it's called the um, Student Math League. The SML is the test that you'll be taking if you're going to take it. And there are two rounds. We take one in the fall and one in the spring. <laughs> are you guys able to, to mute? Oh, uh, what do you mean by Thursday, October 27th from noon to two? I'm gonna, I'll, I'll talk about all that just a second. <laughs> okay. Um, Hit the wrong button. I meant to stop my video, so you're not uh, staring at nothing. Um, there are two rounds, one in the spring and one in the fall. So we're getting ready for the fall one. And you can decide when, how to take it. If you want to take it at the official time, then you'll go to the STEM Center on Thursday, October 27th at 2, or 12 to 2, and take it. If you want to take it unofficially, and I'll explain the difference between the two, you can just go into the STEM Center anytime you have a free hour to take a test. You just have to do it by November 5th, which is actually a Saturday. So I don't think the um, STEM is open on Saturday. So you really November 4th would be, whoops, hold on, sorry. November 4th would be the last day that you can take it. But the difference between the two times is if you take it during the official time, you're, competing officially for the organization. So you're, you are competing against community college students all across the nation. It makes you eligible for organizational awards. I think they have like a $3,000 scholarship for individual and then there's um, awards for the team. And the team is made up of the top five scores for your school that are taken during the official time. So we don't pick the team until we see the top scores. Usually Maricosa doesn't compete nationally um, at this, but it's always possible. So I always wanna encourage students to take it during the official time. Now, if you can't take it during that time, then if you take it during the unofficial time, you're still competing. You're competing against only Maricosa students and the top score, um, either official or unofficial, the top Maricosa score We'll get an award, an award in the spring. The math department has a, uh, an award ceremony in May and you would, um, it's cash. You would get a cash award then. So e either way you have potential to win. Um, eligibility, you just can't have a two year degree yet. And then there's some other conditions for the um, organizational awards. You can find those on the website. There's some credit hour limits and things like that. But again, like I said, that usually doesn't apply to the Miracosta students. We just stand by, you can't have a two-year degree yet. Um, calculators are allowed and in fact, probably needed. A graphing calculator usually won't help you on these tests, but you'll need it like to do arithmetic and stuff. Um, any calculator is allowed as long as it doesn't have an actual keyboard, like a typewriter keyboard. Um, so like the TN92 is not allowed, but any other type of calculator is fine. The test is multiple choice, um, usually multiple choice, 20 questions always, and um, you have one hour to take it. And it's non, they're non-standard challenging questions. So you'll see some samples here in a second to see what I mean by that. They come from a broad range of topics but it's all pre-calculus, so like college algebra and trig, um, probability, and um, what was, oh, and a little bit of geometry sometimes. So there's no calculus on the test at all. Um, it's all before calculus, but they're challenging questions. And then as far as the scoring goes, you're going to get, and I'm going to talk about the strategy here in a minute, but you're, you get two points for every question you get right minus a half a point for every question you get wrong and zero for every question you don't answer. So you get penalized for guessing. So let's talk a little bit about the strategy. 
really picking the problems you're going to answer on these types of tests where you can get penalized for guessing is just as important as answering the questions. So I always recommend that you start by skimming through all the questions first. There'll be 20 of them. Uh, they're not, there's no sort of hierarchy and difficulty. So number one might be harder than number 10. You, there's, there's no order in that way. So skim through, look for question types that you recognize and you think you might be able to solve. I'm going to show you some types today. Um, you're not go into the test knowing that you're not going to answer every question. If you if you go in there and trying to do the whole test, you're going to leave really disappointed. I couldn't go in and answer every question in one hour. It is impossible. You can't do it. You'll see when I start going over some of these problems, some of them I'm not going to do. I picked ones that are shorter to explain, but some of them might take like 20 minutes to solve and you have an hour to take the test. So you're not going to answer every question. So pick your questions carefully and don't guess. That's important. Unless you can um, narrow it down to like maybe two answers and then guess, I would not guess. Because guessing, it has an expected score of zero. If you think about it, the probability of getting an answer correct, I'll just call that C, is one out of five. If there's five choices and multiple choice, if you're just purely guessing with no knowledge, and then the probability of giving, getting a question incorrect would be four out of five. So we would expect that you would get four right if you're just purely guessing because there's 20 questions and 16 wrong. And if you calculate that, you're going to get two points for every right question, but you're going to lose a half a point for every wrong question. And so you're going to end up with a score of zero. You can also end up with negative scores on these tests if you guess too much. So guessing is a bad strategy. Don't do it. Go through the students that do well on this only answer, you know, a few questions and they get them right. So they get the, those, those scores. And just to kind of give you, because um, this is an exercise in humility, these tests are. So to kind of give you, um, if you end up taking it, if you get a score in the double digits, you did really well. I mean, that is a really good score. So just to give you some, um, you know, some, what's the word I'm looking for? Something to base it on. You know, if you get a score of like 10, even though it's out of 40, that's still really good. So just to, to give you an idea of what the scores look like. So you'll probably maybe go in there and only answer three questions, you know, and get a six. And that's a, that's a decent score. Okay. So what I want to do now, are there any questions so far? Well, what I'd like to do now is give you some, show you some sample problems. And these all come from previous somatic tests. And next week at Let's Talk Math, if anybody can make that, it's next um, Tuesday at 530. We're going to do all old somatic questions um, for our problem solving. So you can get even more practice. And like I said, I, I will give you a copy of this file at the end as well. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a problem up. If it was, if we were doing true problem solving, I'd give you a good solid five minutes to solve it. But if I try to do that tonight, I'm not going to be able to get through as many questions as I'd like to. So I'm just going to give you a minute or so to look at it and think about how you would approach it. And if you can solve it in that time, that's great. But um, then I'll talk about the solution and give you the answer to it. And so I kind of broke these down into types. So one type of problem that you see pretty frequently is where you need to do a case-by-case -case analysis. And so I'll let you read this problem. I'm just going to give you like about a minute and a half to look at it. And then we'll talk about how to solve it.
Okay. Now, I, I, you may not have had time to solve it, but I think the problems will be a whole lot more meaningful when I show you the solution if you've at least thought about it a little bit. So this one isn't too long to solve. Did anybody actually um, get an answer for this one? Yeah, so I got B. It looks like there's only one date that wouldn't work. And and I, that's what I did when I first looked at it, but there's actually two. Did anybody get two? Oops, I did not mean to do that. I meant to look at the chat, hold on. What did I do? Hold on, I'm not sure what I did. There we go. That's better. Um, it's actually two. Did anybody get two? No. Well, this is something that they, they do. Notice that February 29th is a leap year, and that's where it gets a little bit tricky. So they'll do this sometimes, though. You have to pay attention to all the little details. So like notice that um, January 31st, that would be 0, 1, 31. So when you multiply that to see if it's magical, you would have to have a year that ends in 31, which we could, you know, in about what, nine years we will. Now, if you take 0 to 29, 2 times 29 is 58. We could have a year that ends in 58, but the leap year, the 29th, only happens every four years. And if you divide 58 by four, it's not an even number. You don't get an even number. So it's not a leap year. So you're never going to have February 29th, 1958. So that's one that can't happen. And then the 31st, 01, 31 would be 93. Yeah, you could have a year that ended in 93. And then the last one, so um, that one's possible. And then the last one would be the 0, 0430, and we get 120 when you multiply. And that's not possible. You can't have, you know, a year. The date's not possible. So that one is also not possible. So it's two. Yes, yeah, so do you have a question? Yeah, no. Um, so I actually was looking at it too. And so uh, in the at the top you see how like the uh the, for the date you know 12 zero, uh 12 zero two, 24 mm -hmm. so i had the i actually had the same idea but i just like i i thought there was three like not possible answers oh okay yeah it turns out there's two so i showed you why all right um let's go on to the next one now the next one is also a um case by case analysis but it'll help you if you can narrow down the cases first. And we, we do that pretty frequently where we look at something and we narrow down the cases. So, and it also deals with place value. So I'll give you, let's just do a minute on this one to think about it. And then I'll show you the solution. I don't think you'll be able to solve it in a minute unless you see a quicker way to do it than I did. But we'll talk about it. I'll let you think about it for a minute. Great. Did anybody get an answer to this one? Maybe I discouraged you before I let you think about it. Um, with this one, what you want to do, so notice that we want to take the number um, AA and multiply it by B. 
And we know that the result needs to turn out to be CBA. Um, so there are lots of possibilities here that we could have because we're looking at the digits, you know, zero through nine. So there are 10 possibilities for every single digit. So there's a lot of cases to look at, but if we can narrow it down, it'll make it possible to do it. So notice here where I multiply B times A, I get A. Now that tells me that I probably had to carry, you know how when you do multiplication by hand, if you get a two digit number, you're gonna put the ones digit um, in the multiplication and then carry the tens digit. So unless A times B gives us A, then um, this must be a two digit number that I'm getting in that first multiplication. And I know that this is not possible because if this was possible, then if I was taking AA times B, I would just get AA and we don't. So we know that that's not possible. So that means that when I'm taking A times B, I'm actually getting a two digit number, we'll call it DA, where we carry the D and then we multiply the A times B again and add the D. And so that means that um, I could write this number DA since it's a two digit number, I can use place value. It's gonna be D times 10, because that's in the, um, the D is in the tens place, plus A times one. I'm using X's for times. A times one, because A is in the ones place. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to subtract A from both sides. And so that's gonna leave me, I'm just gonna write A, B, well, actually, if I write it like that, it looks like a two digit number. So let's do it like this, A times B minus A. And then over here, if I subtract the A, this part's gonna go away and I'm just gonna have 10 times D. And if I factor out the A, that tells me that A times B minus one is equal to 10 D. And so this tells me that A, times B minus one is divisible by 10 because it's equal to 10 D. And so that can give us a bunch of cases that we can work with. If A times B minus one, sorry, that should be a B minus one, is divisible by 10, then we have some cases. One case would be that A is equal to five and then B minus one is even. Because any time you take five times an even number, it's gonna be divisible by 10. So that would be two, four, six, or eight. Otherwise we're gonna get up into three digit numbers. So that means that B can equal three, five, seven, or nine, if I add one. That is one of our cases. Then the other case would be if we flip flop that. B minus one is equal to five. And then A is equal to an even number. Because then again, if you take five times an even number, there should be a six there. Um, you get a, something that's multiple of 10. And so B is going to be six. And so you can see right here that we end up with eight cases. Instead of, I don't know how many um, before, we end up with just eight. And we can look at all those cases then. This would be five six, seven, and eight, and find the one that actually works. So I'll just show you one of them. So if we take, say, like case one, that's where A was five and B was three. A equals five, sorry, and B equals three. So what we're looking at is AA times B. So it would be 55 times three. And if you multiply that, you get 165, and remember, we want it to be in the form of CBA. So it needs to end in A, which it does, but the middle number needs to be B, which it is not, and that didn't work. And so what you're gonna do is you're gonna go through and look at the rest of those eight cases, and you'll find the ones that work are A equal five, B equal nine, because we'd have 55 times nine, gives us, this is where your calculator is going to come in handy, 495. And you can see oh. that's in the form of CBA. Uh, and then the other one that works, is there a question? 
uh, I, uh, my one of my moms is picking me up from the library because she's going to okay, dinner. it's all right. But can I log off or come? Yeah, you can log off. Can I join back? Um, that's up to the host. Uh, uh, will I still get extra credit or not? I'm worried. Um, I don't. Do you need to talk to your teacher about that? I don't know. Did you sign I, I, in? I'm in trouble now. <laughs> Because uh, because she has to go to dinner. Okay. All right. Yeah, but, I recommend just sending a quick email to your instructor and you can check with her. Okay. Uh, can I leave now? Yes. Or stay yeah. on? You're good. Am I good? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, and then the other case that works is the one where A is four and B is six because you're gonna take 44 times six, which gives you 264. Notice how it's in that form. And so if you add those two numbers together, that's what they asked you to do. Find the sum of all possible values of CBA, you're gonna get 759. So that one you can see, I, I picked that one on purpose to show you, well, first of all, place value, but also how involved these problems can be. If you can imagine if you have 20 questions, this is why it's not realistic to try to answer them all. I don't want you to feel bad about that. You're going in there and you're not going to plan on answering them all. Okay, let's go to the next one. So another strategy is factoring. And not, not like basic factoring, just in general, breaking things down into smaller components so you can analyze them. Kind of like we did on the last one. We kind of broke that down into cases, into smaller amounts. So I'll give you a minute to think about this one, and then we'll look at the solution. This one is doable, and maybe not a minute, but it's not as hard as the last one. I'm glad you guys guys are putting your answers in the chat and talking about it. That's good. So the whole point is thinking about these. That's right, Anne. Anne got it. It is E. Um, Anne, do you want to explain what you did? Or do you want me to do um, it? I can go ahead. I'm not sure how valid it was, but yeah. Okay. Um, so yeah, actually, I just started out by factoring. So I rewrote a squared minus b squared as a plus b times a minus b. Mm -hmm. And then 91, its prime factorization is 7 times 13. Yep. So I set a plus b equal to 7 and a minus b equal to 13. Okay. And then I solved that and I ended up getting A equals 10 and B equals negative three. Okay. And so then I just plug that into A squared plus B squared and I ended up getting 109. So the ones digit would be nine. That's right. And then, um, so good job, very good job. Now, she that she did if uh, I'm all tongue tied here as a mathematician, there are other cases and other things that would come into play, but she's just trying to get to that answer and she did. And that's perfect. The only thing I want to say is one times 91 would also work. And so if you take a look at that, though, you're going to end up with something less than a thousand. So or bigger than a thousand. So it's it doesn't work when it comes to the a squared plus b squared. That's why they have 
this little condition right here. So good job. And the answer was to find their sum. Or no, the answer was to find the units digit of n. So that's why it was nine. So place value, make sure you're, you know, up to speed on your place value and stuff too. Okay, let's I look. Also Go ahead. Got the answer, but I thought it's a different method sort of than. Oh, what, what did you do? Did. So I kind of thought about what the values for A and B would be if the square equals 91. So then I thought A must be equal to 10 so that it's 100 and then b must be equal to three because three squared if you subtract 100 minus nine it ends up being 91 and then i just added together 100 plus nine to get n ah. and one's digit had a nine nice nice yes yeah and again that's that's the kind of way that you want to look at these problems um if you can see something and it looks like it's working, go with it. It may, you know, there may be other cases that you're missing or whatnot, but because of the time constraints, what you did, Melina, that's perfect. Because you found, you found the answer that way too, just by looking at the numbers. Good job. Okay. Thank another, uh -huh, another common theme is like one like this, where you have to do like an estimation. I called it strategic approximation. So you have to figure out um, the least amount of dimes she could have, and they don't tell you exactly how much money she has. So you kind of have to approximate using some skills. So I'm going to give you a minute to think about this one, and then, because um, there are different ways to approach this one for sure, and then we'll talk about some of the solutions. Okay, did anybody get an answer for this one? Did you have time? Well, the answer turns out <clears throat> to be 11. It's B. And I'll show you how I did it. I said that D, I'm going to let D be the number of dimes. And one thing I wanted to point out with these questions, they vary, you know, back in elementary school, they'd give you those word problems where they throw in stuff that you don't need. You know, they throw in numbers to confuse you. They don't do that on these questions. Every, every word in these problems is important. So you really want to pay attention to everything. So she has two dozen coins. So if D is the number of dimes, then 24 minus D will be the number of nickels because she only has dimes and nickels. And she has a total of two dozen or 24. And so when you take the value of her money, let's put it in cents, it's going to be 10D for the dimes and 5 times 24 minus D for the nickels. We know that that has to be between 172 cents and 211 cents. I'm sorry, it came back. That was a mistake. Okay. Glad you could come back. Um, and now, now you can just solve this little inequality. So we have 172 is less than or equal to, if you solve this, you're going to get 5D plus 120. Less than or equal to 211. And then if you just finish solving that, you end up with D between 10.4 and 18.2. 
And so it asks, what's the least, remember, every word is important. What's the least number of dimes she could have? Well, that would be the next whole number after 10.4, so 11. <clears throat> so these strategic approximation type problems are usually doable. I would suggest if, if you see one of those, it won't be exactly like this, but if you see one of those, it would be one that you um, might want to, uh, you know, give it a try. It might be one worth trying. Are there any questions? I see stuff in the chat, but it's hard for me to follow the chat. I'm just connected here on this one device. So we, you guys let me know if there's something I need to answer, Anne or Melina. Yeah, they they were okay. just talking about how you went from a dollar and seventy two cents to one hundred and seventy two. So we have to have the same units, so we put everything in pennies rather than des you know using dollars. Okay, now this next one is, and there is often one of these on a pneumatic test where they define some binary operation using some new definition that they give you. If you see one of these, I would do it because they're almost always pretty easy. So I'll give you guys a minute on this one. If you understand what it's saying, I think you'll definitely be able to get the answer in a minute. And this might look familiar to you. We did it last Tuesday night, but in mod eight. <laughs> but I'll give you a minute and then we'll talk about it. Okay, I was able to take a quick look at the chat there and I saw Danny got it right. Maybe some other people got it right as well. The correct answer was D, 81. And a binary operation is, well, addition. If you're adding two numbers, that's a binary operation. And so in this case, they're defining this new one called triangle, which I'm calling it triangle, which means you multiply the two numbers and then add the second number. So like when you do the three triangle two, you're gonna take three times two and add two. And once we get that, we're gonna triangle it with two times three and add three. And so the first number is going to work out to be eight and the second number is nine. And now we're gonna triangle eight and nine. So we're gonna do eight times nine plus nine, which gives us 81. So if you see one of those, pick it. You're all you're pretty much guaranteed to get it right. Those are usually pretty easy. Okay. Any questions or comments so far? Is this thing hard? Yes. It's a hard test. It is. Yes. Hold on. Am I getting the extra credit or not? Okay. Was... Let's move on to the next question. Any extra credit questions are for your teacher. Your teacher is the only one that can assign extra credit to you because he or she is in charge of your grade. So you'll need to contact your teacher to find out about that. Okay, this one. If you guys that come to Let's Talk Math, I can't quite get this all on the screen, but this is a logic question. I would say about once a year, they throw a logic question onto... Um, the amatic test. Sometimes it's the knights and knaves um, and spies. This one's not that, but it's it's a logic question. And let me give you two minutes on this one so you can think about it a little longer, and then I'll talk about the solution. This is another one that students often get right on the amatic test. It's like one of the most the logic question is usually one of the most frequently correctly answered questions. 
So it's another one to look for. Okay, did anybody get an answer? I don't know if two minutes was enough time. Uh, I got D. D is right, good job. There are mathematical ways to, to do like logic problems, but typically, unless you've had like discrete math, you're not gonna know those things. So most of us, you know, just go through and just try to do it with trial and error is what I would do. So I'm just going to show you how, like one scenario, I'm not going to do the whole thing, but I would then continue like this to finally get to the answer. So how I approached it, and Anne, you can tell me after if you did something different, I just went through, we're trying to find who got the math award. So I just started with Al and said, let's say Al gets the math award. So if Al gets math, what we're going to do is we're going to go through and look at the other cases and see if we come up with a contradiction. If we do, then we throw, we say Al didn't get math, and then we move on to Bo and so on. And so if Al won math, we know that the people that um, get math and biology awards are correct in their guesses. So if Al won math, that means he's correct. So come back over. This is what everybody said right here. So um, if Al won math, he's correct. That means Di got bio because Al, we know Al was right. He won math. Now that means Di is right also because the person who won bio is also right. So that means that um, Bo won physics because she says Bo is physics. That means Bo is wrong because Bo won physics, the only math and bios are right. So we go back to Bo and that means Bo is wrong. So psi cannot be chemistry because Bo is wrong. But look, all that's left is chemistry. So we have a contradiction, it's not possible. And so you're gonna go through and do that. So now try letting Bo win math and see what happens and then psi. And then finally, you'll get down to the only one that doesn't give you a contradiction is die. Did you do anything different, Anne? Um, that is the exact method I use. Okay. Um, as you mentioned, you actually can use discrete and it would involve constructing a truth table. But right. this is actually a lot easier. So if you haven't had discrete <laughs> yet, don't feel bad. You're, you're just as good off. Yeah, and I and I honestly don't remember. I know there's a truth table involved. I've never taught discrete, so I don't remember that method. Um, so you can do it without it. You can just do like a case by, by case analysis on the logic problems. Um, you just have to power through it is what I would suggest. Did anyone else approach this one a different way?
No? Okay. Um, let's go to the next one then. Now this one involves logs. So one thing that I recommend that you do, I can't quite get this all on the screen, is brush up on your properties of logs because um, there's certainly going to be a problem that involves that. And so I'll give you a minute to look at this one. I kind of doubt you'll be able to solve it in a minute, but I'll let you at least see where it's going. Think about it a little bit. Oh, I didn't know Math 102 did um, truth tables. Cool. I've never taught that class either. Did anyone get any progress on this one? Um, is it eight? Is it eight? No. Good try, no. though. The, the six. Correct, it's six. That's right. Yes. It's six. yes. it's six. Now, let's look at why. Um, when you have the properties of logs, so right here, they tell us that the log base four of M is equal to log base six of N is equal to log base nine of m plus n. And let's say all of that is just equal to x. Let's call it x. And so I can write each of these in um, exponential form. So log base four of m equal x is the same thing as four to the x equals m. The middle one is the same thing as six to the x equals n. And the last one is the same thing as m plus n equals well, let's write it the same way. Nine to the X equals M plus N. And they want us to find M divided by N. So let's look at that. That's going to be four to the X over six to the X, which I can write as, let's throw in, review your rules of exponents as well here. Um, four, six to the X, which is two thirds to the X. And that's what I'm trying to find. I'm trying to find M over N. Now I'm going to use this right here. We know that M plus N is equal to nine to the X. So M is four to the X plus N is six to the X. And that's going to equal nine to the X. Now let's break these down into smaller pieces. Four is two squared. So I can write four as two to the two X. I can write six to the X as two to the X times three to the X. That would still be six to the X. And I'm gonna subtract the nine to the X and nine is three squared. So that's three to the two X is equal to zero. And now I'm going to divide everything by three to the two X. And so when I divide everything by three to the two X, the first one will be two thirds to the two X plus here, this is going to one of the three to the X's will cancel. So I'll just have two thirds to the X minus one equals zero. And this is actually a quadratic equation in disguise. If we let U equal um, two thirds to the X, which is what I'm trying to find. That's actually M divided by N. That's what we want to find. Um, I can rewrite this as U squared plus U minus one equals zero. And now we can use the quadratic formula and you're going to end up with U equals negative one plus or minus the square root of five 
over two. And they said one of the answers will be in the form a plus square root b over c, and that's exactly what we have here. So a is negative one, b is five, and c is two. And if we add those, which they want us to do, you're going to get six. I don't know if anyone approached the problem a different way. I have a feeling there's probably multiple ways to do that one, but that's how I saw it. Okay. Any questions or comments about that one? Okay. Now, another thing, in addition to the properties of logs, to go into this test feeling really strong and ready for it, I would go over your basic trig identities too. And by the basic ones, I mean the Pythagorean, the um, double angle, just for sine and cosine, I think would be sufficient. And then the um, sum and difference for just for sine and cosine is usually going to be sufficient. And so I'll give you just a, a minute to look at this one. I don't think it's too hard. If you see how to do it, you can probably get the answer in a minute if you remember your trig identities. If you don't, it might be a little harder, but I'll give you a minute to think about it. Then we'll look at the solution. Um, is it D? No, it's not D. Uh, a B? <laughs> nope, it's not B. Well, let me think heavily. Uh, a cos and a tan. E. <laughs> I'll show you in just a second. Okay. Uh, is it going to end in 10 minutes, the session? Yes. 10 yes. minutes? Yes. Okay. All right. Did anybody get an answer? Anyone else attempt this one to get an answer? something uh, I got there. A and a, a. also got A yeah yeah A is the right <laughs> answer so what you're going to do with this one here's how I did it this isn't the only way to do it but whenever I see something that can be a complex fraction I go for simplifying it so like tangent I can write as sine over cosine so I have a fraction within a fraction so I'm just going to go through and multiply everything by cosine x on top and everything by cosine x on the bottom. That's just like multiplying by one, and that will get rid of my complex fraction. So on top, I have two sine x cosine x. And on the bottom, I have cosine squared x minus here it's going to cancel. So I'll just have sine squared x. And those are the two double angle identities. The two sine x cosine x is the same thing as sine two x and cosine squared x minus sine squared x is the same thing as cosine two x. So those are the double angle identities and then sine over cosine is tangent. So we end up with tangent two x. All right, any questions or comments about that one? Okay. Um, another thing that you might want to brush up on if, you know, before you take the test, if you're looking, you know, to test competitively is I left a little too much room there, but the properties of linear functions, make sure you know how to find slope and the equation of a line and the intercepts. Those are the things that I would look at. So let me give you um, a minute to look at this one and then might be able to get it in a minute. Is it C? Let's let everybody work on it for a second before I tell whether the answer is right. Or not. Because I have other problems I have to deal with and it's going to be harsh for me. 
I understand. This, this is just this is just friend friendly. We aren't like keeping scores or anything here. So just try to work it out, and then we'll go over the solution together. Okay. Did anyone get an answer? It's not C, unfortunately. Did anyone get get something else? I got something else. What did you get? A squared minus B squared. Nope. No, no, no. Well, um, I think A, B. Yeah, the correct answer is A. It's A, B. And so on this one, um, what you have to remember, if f of x is x squared, then these points are a, a squared, and negative b, b squared. Because when you square negative b, you're still going to get b squared. And so we can get the slope. The slope is the change in the y's over the change in the x's. And if you simplify that, you're just going to get a plus b. No, a minus b because the bottom is a plus b. So it factors and it will simplify to a minus b for your slope. And then we can plug it into the equation of the line, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. And then you're gonna write it in slope intercept form, um, y equal mx plus b, or you can just plug in zero for x, but that b is going to be your y intercept. So if I solve this, um, I'm going to have y minus a squared equals a minus b times x minus a. And so y minus a squared is equal to ax minus a squared plus a b. Um, well, I missed one. a squared, let's see, minus a, let's see, ax. Um, what am I missing? Bx I x think. squared plus, oh yeah, minus Bx. Yeah, Bx. <laughs> in my foil. Okay, and so these x's are going to be put together. So we have a minus Bx. Notice how that's our slope. And then if I add a squared to both sides, it's going to cancel out. And so my y-intercept is a b. All right, last one um, that I wanted to show you is a geometry one. I think I'm just gonna, we'll just go ahead and look at the solution of this because I wanna have time to put the answers in the, or to put some files in the chat. But remember how I said that every single word is important, pay attention. So let triangle ABC be a right triangle with integer length sides. That's really important because in a right triangle, We have the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. There are only um, a handful of numbers, a, b, and c, where these are integers. Those are called Pythagorean triples. The most famous Pythagorean triple is 3, 4, 5. So that means if I take 3 squared plus 4 squared, it equals 5 squared. And if you multiply those by any constant, those will also be Pythagorean triples. So if I multiply all those by two, six, eight, 10 make Pythagorean triples. If I multiply all those by three, nine, 12, 15 make Pythagorean triples. And then there's some other Pythagorean triples that aren't quite as commonly known, five, 12, and 13, and eight, 15, and 17. Now there are others, but I don't need to go any bigger than these because look, my biggest perimeter is 40. So if I start getting numbers bigger than this, um, my perimeter is gonna be bigger than 40. And then you should know like some of the basic, I would say area and perimeter formulas from geometry. So like area here is going to be one half 
base times height. And in this case, it's going to be one half, the base is B and the height is A. So you're gonna take one half AB. And so just go through, it's another case by case analysis. These are our A, B and C's and you're just gonna go through and you're looking for the ones that um, the perimeter is the same thing as the area. So I, we want the largest one. So I would start with our biggest, this eight, 15 and 17. If you add those together, the perimeter is 40 but the area is going to be one half eight times 15, and that's going to give me 60. So that one doesn't work because the perimeter has to equal the area. So let's go to the next biggest one, which is probably, um, I guess nine, 12 and 15 is bigger than five, 12 and 13. So you would do the same thing with this one. If you add these up, you're going to get 36 for the perimeter. And so the area is going to be one half nine times 12, which gives us 54. So that one doesn't work either. So we go to the next biggest one, which is this one right here, and you'll see that it works. If you add those, you get a perimeter of 30, and the area is going to be one half five times 12, which is also 30. And so that is the biggest one that works. You'll see that some of the other ones work, but they want us to find the largest one. So again, to emphasize every single word in the problems is important. Pay attention to every little detail. All right, so those were the 10 that I went through. I'm going to save this and put it in the chat. Um, save as. And then I'm also going to give you um, another sample test and put it in the chat. So let me stop share. I'm scared. I'm scared. It's noon day. Whoops. Bye. Okay. So I'm going to put some files in the chat. Just give me a second. To bye. 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 Goodbye. Bye. Okay, so the first one is going to be the problems that I went over today. If it lets me, it's my computer's being really slow when I'm in Zoom. <clears throat> I have them all open and ready to go, but it's making me find them again. So is everybody here planning on taking it? Yeah, I think the problems on it are pretty fun. <laughs> yeah, it's me a, too. It's a, it's a good experience and I didn't mention it, but um, you can also, you know, it's something that you can put on your, uh, any applications. There, There's the one, let me add the other. Like any applications to your four-year college and also, um, you know, resumes too. It's something that you can use. I'm having trouble finding all the files. Just a second. Why is it doing this to me? Hold on. Uh, well, while, while you're looking for the files, let me just say that thank you so much for giving this this um, amatic review session. I think I'm a lot better prepared now and it was a lot of fun. Oh, good, thank you. I wish we, um, okay, here we go. Here's a sample test too. So if you guys want some more practice, come to Let's Talk Math on Tuesday. It, we have, you know, that's more time before you, the official test is. And on Tuesday, we're doing all um, amatic problems. They're all from old automatic tests on Tuesday. So hopefully I'll see some of you guys there. Did the files come through? Yes, thank you. Okay. Yeah, right. I received them. Thank you. All right, well, good luck, everybody. I'll be the one grading it. So I, I hope to see some high scores from you guys when you take it. Remember, double digits is high. <laughs> double digits is good. <laughs> all right, thank, thanks everyone for coming.
Bye.